So what it means to rack a royal, so it's made by me and Ellie Hills, it's not the snakes, it's us. And that's something I'm going to be repeating throughout this thing. It's not the snakes, it's us. So who we are, I'm Liam Sinclair. I've got a bachelor's degree in animal management. So is Ellie. She's also got a, a master's degree. We started reptiles and research to combat a lot of the misinformation we see in the reptile hobby and then to combat that with a lot of evidence-based scientific husbandry information. Before we go into it, does anyone keep in wax? Okay. So there's no one that's going to be like terrified of what I'm about to say. So before we go into it, into the deep end, we need to preface this with how an understanding of the micro and macro of how animals learn. So the macro of how animals learn is basically an action. An action has a consequence, whether that is beneficial or negative to the animal equals whether they repeat it or avoid it. So that's the macro. The micro is where we have neurons, which are special cells in our brains, and that basically means that they communicate with electronic and chemical signals from the brain and then to the central nervous system. And the synapses are the connection points between, between the two neurons, and that allows the connection point to go across. So neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to modify its shape and size in relation to experiences. So that's what makes the brain so malleable and how easy it is for it to learn. So what happens is that when neurons fire consistently, together in this neural pathway, when they do it over multiple repetitions, they get stronger and more efficient at doing the action. That's why the more you do a task, the better you get at doing it, but it's the neurons in your head that are allowing you to repeat it at a more efficient rate. That's basically the basis of learning. So then when we don't do that, the reverse happens and our neural pathways can atrophy. And I think you're gonna guess where I'm gonna go with this. So basically the brain structure can change in response to stimulus or lack of stimulus. So it can go either way. So you can see in this picture here, you've got an example of like a strong pathway, the, st the pathway more travelled, and then you've got your weak pathway. Am I blocking you guys? Are you good? Yeah, no, we're good. Good. Okay, cool. So less travelled, less efficient, slightly atrophied. So neuroplasticity is not something that's crazy for like just intelligent animals. It's been found and observed in honeybees. It's been observed in sea slugs. It's been observed in fish. A lot of mammals, but I went for the lab rat there. It's been observed in rattlesnakes. So we do know that it happens in the brain of snakes. So learning and adapting in snakes is supported by the neuroplasticity. And obviously this has happened in a load of studies. So in corn snakes, I did a study where they had like a minimal, a, sorry, a minimal enclosure and they had an enriched enclosure and a hole in between. And they allowed the corns to choose between the two. And what happened was that the corns chose the enriched enclosure. That's the neurons firing and the neural pathways are firing in response to stimulus that they're getting to do in the enriched enclosure. And obviously they are seeing that as a positive, therefore the action is repeated. And those neural pathways are firing in response to a myriad of different scenarios in that enclosure, and that's how they are learning. Rat snakes, black rat snakes actually, were shown to have superior learning capabilities and enriched housing. So they were smarter and they were quicker at doing learning trials in compared to ones kept in minimalist enclosures. So again, neural pathways are firing more efficiently. They have an abundance of more neurons firing and they're getting more efficient at the task they're doing, which is why they have a superior learning capability. So different parts of the brain are firing, which means they're getting used, which means they are more complex and they're more efficient and they're getting used more and they're able to do more because of that. Burmese pythons were trained to press a lit up button and when they pressed it they got a food reward. So that is a really good example of a member of the same genus as royal pythons was able to be trained using operant conditioning. So basically that again action equals positive consequence means action is repeated. The neural pathway is firing in response to if I press this button I get food and that's a really really like non-natural thing, yet they have the learning capabilities to do that. I'd have chosen me to beat them. <laughs> <laughs> if they look at me in a certain way, I know they're hungry. <laughs> they sort of move about, and it's obviously a feedback which I've reinforced over the years. But you're not a little button, though. <laughs> I'm not a button. No. But they, they just press my button and say, no, <laughs> And the same basically happened with Madagascan giant hog noses. Basically, when they're put in a rich environment, their behavioural diversity increases and they could do more. They have neural, more neural pathways in relation to different experiences. They have more behaviours and expressed more because they could do more. 
So what does this happen to do with Royals? So basically what I've just laid up for you is I was waiting for someone to say, well, Royals are dumb, they don't do much. Well, that's because that's how learning works. That's how the brain works. It's no exception. Royals are not the exception to the rule. So they're not the dumb, the dumb, the dumb pet rocks that people think they are. It's not them, it's what we're doing to them. So it's not them, it's us. It's the fun bit. So what happens to a royal's brain, or can happen to a royal's brain in Iraq, when it's kept in a situation with a lack of stimulation, complete darkness, little to no opportunities whatsoever, the following can occur. Low adaptability to change, a reduced resiliency, a reduced cognitive ability, like in other studies, limited ability to cope with stress, and that's a big part of what's going to happen in the rest of this presentation. They have the inhibited problem solving, and they have a lower cognitive ability to do that. And that's to do with the parts of the brain we're going to go over in a minute. They have increased fearfulness and a generalized of, of fear. And they have increased likelihood of stereotypies. If they're experiencing fearful stimulus as the majority of their experiences, but nothing else in terms of problem solving, you've got brain structures that are associated with fear responses, i.e. their amygdala. They'll have more neurons firing, more neural pathways engaging, and it's like the muscles. If you go to the gym, your muscles get bigger. If you don't use it, your muscles atrophy. It's the same with the brain. You can have stru certain structures in the brain will get larger than others. Now, what can happen then is areas that are associated with the context of fear or others that are to do with problem solving. The hippocampus, which if it's not being used in context of fear, because it allows them to understand the context of said fear and then decide what they're going to do about it, that can be diminished. So what can actually have happen is a skewing of ratio of the size of structures in the brain. Skewing toward a fearful, generalized fearfulness. Obviously that example down there is from Canova. No light, no opportunities, no stimulation. That, that example is a pure example of just sensory deprivation. So what's happening like culturally within our hobby? Well basically we're putting them in the rack as a rule, some of them are getting neural pathway atrophy, diminished cognitive ability because of it, because they're in the deprived environment and the parts of the brain that allow them to do complex things aren't being used, but the fearful parts are. And then we put them in a vivarium and breeders will like, oh, I'll test this. They put their adult breeders in a viv and then you put an animal with a brain that's been conditioned for the deprived environment into a complex environment. We're talking new textures, new smells. If there's UV, they're going to see in a color spectrum they've never seen before. New tastes a lot. That animal's been set up to fail, basically. And then because of that, maybe it stops eating, maybe it shies away. That gets misinterpreted falsely as the rack being the best thing for them rather than the thing that caused the problem in the first place. And that's why we get dogmatic information spread in the hobby about the species thriving and belonging in racks because we're going through this cycle loop. And that's just the one example of one animal. You get this done 10 times. You get people more and more vindicating the belief that this is the best thing for them. You get that done a thousand times, then you get absolute rules. And that's how we go through the cycle. Also in royals, and generally this is conserved across most vertebrates, is that you either have a bold and a proactive style of coping with stress, or you have basically a passive and withdrawn style of coping with stress. So if you're the bold proactive type, you have a bit of stress, but you are able to deal with that stress and you are metabolizing the stress hormones faster than the, the alternative. If you are the withdrawn type, and you can have individuals within the same species that go one way or the other or somewhere along the spectrum. When you experience stress, you actually metabolize that stress out of the body at a far slower rate. So what happens to when we get an animal that is the passive type and then we stress them and then we stack the stress and then it takes a long time to leave and then we stack on top of that and then we stack on top of that. And again, actually, that is heritable as well because you have subpopulations of a species, something like Morelia bradley, that is a proactive coping style. They'll either stand and strike or flee. Or if you put them in a situation they want to get out of, they'll actively try to get out of it. You take some, as a rule, you can have individuals that go one way or the other, but as a species, they, they can have a generalized way of going about it. As royals in general are the latter, they are the passive withdrawn type, which is why they go into a ball. You can get individual royals which are bold and outgoing as a coping style of stress, but they are the outliers generally. So why do some struggle going from a rack to a vivarium and then some do fine? Well, that's because there's so many different variables in how an individual snake adapts. 
So it's all to do with how the individual snake, what is experienced, its genetics, and then, like I say, its stress coping style. Some may have more initially to work with than others and what they've got going on up there, based on, based on their past experiences, neural pathways, and learning opportunities. So I've got an example here of a hypothetical of two breeders. Now, breeder one and breeder two keep exact way, same way. They keep in a rack. That rack is the same brand, same dimensions, everything. Same shaving, same water bowl, same, temp same temperatures. The whole thing is identical. The difference between the two is how the breeders operate. Now, consciously, they're thinking they do the exact same thing. They keep the exact same way. Subconsciously, the way they work is entirely different. So breeder one, he opens his rack. He pulls the water bowl out. He shuts the rack, and then he goes and cleaning. Then he puts it back in and shuts it. Breeder two actually opens the rack. He pulls the water bowl out. He's cleaning it. He just leaves it open. He's pottering around, playing in the bang, and he's cleaning and whatnot. And then he goes and takes it back into the rack. During this time, the royal may have actually been taking information, even come forward, sit on the edge, and he's watching what's going on. I don't know if any of you have ever used racks, and you've seen this, where the royal actually comes forward after time, and is like watching you, and you have to actually get them to go back in to shut it. So that happens, and when they're doing a full service of the tray, maybe they like need to do a full clean because of after feeding. Breeder one opens it, takes the snake, puts it in an empty rack drawer, and then serves the enclosure. Breeder two takes the snake out, puts it on a table where he's got things like dust pans, spray bottles, all his equipment, loads of different things, and then he leaves the snake as he's doing his thing, and he's cleaning the enclosure, he's cleaning the rack, sorry, and that snake is just rolling the table. That, that snake is experiencing new items that change each time. They're experiencing new tastes, new smells, new textures, new everything. Now, what is something that is novel and new to them? Enrichment. So they have a different table each time, and they have the time to adjust and actually explore this table. Now, depending on how much he faffs around, how long it takes to actually clean, clean the rack, depends on how long he actually gets to be on the table. But Breeder 1 works in silence, and then Breeder 2 plays music. Now, I don't know if you saw it recently, the study that came out that said that snakes can hear airborne noises. So snakes can hear, that is a thing. And then Breeder 1 pulls the tray out, closes it when he's done, I don't know how many times you've seen someone, they go about their way, they get so fast at what they're doing, they're just, just doing their thing. <laughs> and then breeder one slowly opens it, the water's not sloshing, slowly closes it. And then you can see from this example that consciously they're keeping the exact same way and their racks look identical, but the way they operate is entirely different. And in the amount of information that these snakes between these two populations of these breeders, what they're experiencing, their learning opportunities is entirely different. The neural pathways that will be strengthening and efficient and being more, made more efficient in response to different stimulus will be a myriad of different variables on breeder two compared to breeder one. Now, when we make this more extreme and we say that one rack breeder keeps in a translucent tray rather than an opaque, then you can see suddenly that how many variables start coming out into this. So there's so many different variables that you can even come up with that play a role in how many learning experiences a snake can have, even though everyone says, oh yeah, I keep in a rack. We're talking generally about something that is actually quite variable. Again, it's not the snakes, all of it is us. It's our only ability to interpret the situation. Again, age has an effect on plasticity. So neuroplasticity is greatest at a younger age when an organism needs to rapidly learn and adopt life skills. And that is something you'll see when, say, like a human finds it easier to learn languages at a young age compared to as an adult. Now, again, what also might be a variable is the snake has less history and experience with the rack. You think about a snake that was in a rack for three months and you bought it as a baby and you've actually had it for six years. Now, you flip that and that animal's been in that, that rack, especially a style like that Canova image where there's literally nothing in there. Six years in a rack, and then three months of you you can see one why, will one why one will struggle compared to the other. And then because of that, the greater plasticity and less learning experiences, they may adapt more readily to success successfully to new environments. And then we couple that with some really poorly executed vivariums. You have many pillars of breeding communities say that they're going to test their royals and vivariums. And then the vivariums they actually set up are like lackluster to say the least. So... They might even go further than they would, they would in, a, in a rack. So they put like one hide one end and then one hide the other. There's still an open space in the middle. And when you've got an animal that may actually be so far along, it's got a skewed brain structure and a chemically and neurologically have 
don't have the pathways in relation to complexity and problem solving and spatial mapping, and then they set that up poorly as well, what chance does that snake have? So what's happened when it's actually been studied when they've put snakes in racks and then vivs? Well, 35 royals were housed in a rack and then they put them in a viv. This was in Germany, this paper. The snakes expressed a greater amount of behaviours in the vivarium and then they expressed stress behaviours in the rack. So if you can see on the left, I don't know if you can read it from there, but it's the frequency of mouth pushing against a barrier. So I don't know if you've ever seen it where they're like pushing their nose against something. That happened proportionally way more in the rack than it did in the vivarium. And it happened between the hours of 4 p.m. and 11. And, uh, and what happens in an opaque rack? You can't see in. And the only time you see in an opaque rack is when you open it. And then what happens when you open it? You, you interrupt what the snake's doing. So if that's at the front pushing and you open that on the snake's at the front, they're like, oh, you must want feeding. And you'll never ever see what the snake's doing because to open it to see, you will, you will interrupt that behavior and you'll never get a true reflection of what they're doing when you're not influencing it. So when they went into the, the actual vivarium, they did a whole lot more and they had more neurons firing in relation to different things they can do. They have cognitive abilities that are firing. Parts of their brains are firing now that are doing more than what they could do in that top rack. By the way, they put more in that rack up there than what traditionally we see as a standard in the hobby. There's even a hide, which is uh, more than what some give. But what happens when we do the reverse? Because let's face it, people generalize the animals as being like, oh, it's just a royal. We just transfer it from whatever housing we want. Well, well, the removal of choice and agency to go about their day and do what they want at any given time is incredibly stressful. The removal and enrichment and value resources can, feed, can lead to feelings of learned helplessness in depression-like states. And that is conserved across the board. That is not something that's from human studies, this is from animals. What's interesting is that when it was studied in rats, when they induced rats into this depression-like state, they ate more. So what do people claim rats are really good for? Getting them to eat more. So that's not been studied in snakes to say that, but just something to think about there. So what happens when you take an animal that knows stimulation, complexity, that has developed neural pathways over a myriad of things, and then you put that in a state, state of sensory deprivation with nothing? What do we think is going to happen? How many times have you heard someone say, oh yeah, it just needs time to settle down. It just needs time to settle down. It'll be all right. It'll settle down. It's not settling down. What's happening is it succumbs eventually to a state of learned helplessness. This means that it learns its actions have no effect upon the outcome, and the snake just gives up and becomes apathetic. And then this is interpreted by the keeper as the snake being content. And then we go back into this feedback loop of us not knowing what's going on. Again, it's not the snakes. It's entirely us. So how should we transition a royal from a rack to a viv? Well, I've come up with soft transition and hard transition, but I've basically transferred this from things with wildlife rehab. Hard transition is like when you see a goose and they like open a container and they're like, get out. And then you see soft transition, well, basically they'll do an enclosure outside and they'll still feed it. And then they'll go from not feeding it to leaving the door open, then let it come and go. And then eventually they shut the gate and it's gone. So that's why I've taken this from soft transition to hard transition. So hard transition, what I'm defining this is as when you chuck the snake directly in the viv, that is directly a roll of the dice. So, and then a soft transition is you learn as much about how that royal was previously kept by the breeder, and then you try and replicate that for the animal. So I'm talking like get a rub, take a hole saw to, take a hole saw to it, put a hole on the lid, heat mat underneath it, same sort of shavings, furnishings as what was in the rack, a water bowl in there, basically set up a mini rack system scenario in your vivarium with a hole on top and you let the snake come and go at the pace that it wants. And the most important part of this is that we have no expectations of the snake. So many of us have expectations of the snake but we don't realise it. Oh, I want to hold it. Oh, I want to do this. I want to be an outgoing snake. Oh, I want to show my mates. But the important part is that we as the person and the keeper have no expectations of the snakes and we just let it be, do what it is going to do. If it hits the ground running, great. If not, you put a contingency in place. Again, the coping style of stress comes into this. If you've got a bold and proactive coping style of stress, you may succeed in a hard transition. If you've got a withdrawn and passive style, it's very, very likely that the hard transition's going to mean you're going to have to walk it back and try A3 again. And that soft transition, uh, sorry, that 
that passive and withdrawn style and proactive doesn't necessarily mean posit positive proactive. If a corn snake turns around and rattles and runs or bites, the running is proactive. It's when they freeze and not flight that is where it's passive and withdrawn. So how do we fix it? How do we fix it is by breaking the cycle of education. Basically, we need to get to the point where we understand what's happening and the education is out there collectively at a larger scale so that we break the cycle and we stop them misinterpreting it as the rack being the best thing for them. Once we get to that stage and we break the cycle, then we can move forward. But at the moment, it's a load of locking horns and everyone's making really good points about like enrichment being good. But because no one understands what's happening and they don't understand why some do well and some don't, we're not getting anywhere, basically. So we need to break the cycle, and once we do, then the conversation's gonna open up. And then questions. So once they reach an older age, is it possible to rebuild neural pathways, or is that basically it? Yeah, it's possible. It's just potentially a struggle. If, it depends, because like young animals, they're at such a young age, and that the neuroplasticity is such a greater rate that you can probably come back from it really easily. Older animals, we're talking things that have spent like years and even decades in Iraq, they may struggle quite a lot. I mean, Ellie, you had a royal that you got and you gave it a hide and it couldn't even figure out what a hide was. It would just try and get behind the hide and it took it weeks and weeks and weeks to even figure out how to go in a hide. And we've got examples of people, we're friends with trainers and behaviorists where they let things come out and wander and they've got five, six year old royals where they couldn't even perceive that the door was open in front of them. That's how cognitively deprived they are. They can't even cope with the fact that knowing that a door's in front of them. So it's going to take work, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible. Just hard. No worries. So having oils that can recognise a quarter inch, a quarter of a millimetre gap, mm. right open, climb up, up six foot of other blooming tanks is quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Apart from when you're trying to fish them out from behind said tank. Yeah, well it's funny because like while we're talking about neuroplasticity and whatnot, you can train these snakes really to a really high degree. So no one does it because everyone thinks they're stupid. Everyone thinks that reptiles are so stupid when actually you can train them. We've got friends that target train them. So when they're behind things, they're not pulling them out. They've put a target down and the snakes followed it out and then they've picked the snake up. So there is such a upper level of care that no one's even touching upon because no one knows it exists. There's also those false sort of myths about the their ecology as well. People still think that they literally live in termite mounds, which is absolute crap. So yeah. you're, I'm just going to repeat it for the mic. So basically, myths about their false ecology and living in termite mounds and whatnot. So that isn't wrong, but it isn't the totality to what people make it out is. So yeah. royals by nature are less active. No one's saying they're not less active, they're just not dormant as what people think they are. So in the wild, they spend a lot of their time in places like burrows or termite mounds or something like that. But in the wild, actually, they're actually raiding birds' nests and eating parrot juveniles, African grey parrots. Um, they're eating, the majority, they're eating basically birds up to about two foot long. And then we start to get back into mammals again. But even the mammals that the adult females are taking when we're doing stomach, stomach flush studies, they're eating like bats and bush babies and things like that as well as rats. So they're climbing to get these things. They're not sitting in a hole and they're waiting for a bat to climb down there. Like they're going out and get stuff. So they aren't the thing that people make them out to be. And I had examples of this as well recently where someone had their royal in a rack and it was really tightly coiled up and it was hugged by the walls. It was that small of a tub. And she moved it up into a bigger tub and it was in the middle, like in that picture of that Canova one. I'll go back for, you for the example. It's got a good example, actually. So Canova, it's not touching the sides. It was in the middle like that. And she was like, oh, it stopped eating. And everyone's like, it's the size of the tub. Like, it's too big. And I was like, why are we talking about the size of the tub and not thinking about the micro of what's happening in the, in the tub? So before, it was, does anyone know what positive thigmatexis is? So basically, it's when you you self-soothe basically from touching objects or like in a tight space. That's why I like tight spaces, it's positive thigmotaxis. That's why, say like in the summer, and you have a sheet rather than a quilt, but you're used to the heavy quilt because you like the positive thigmotaxis on yourself and you struggle to sleep. That's me anyway. I'm just assuming everyone's like that, but that's just me. Um, 
So basically what happens before is that that animal was able to hug itself by that tight coil as well as being hugged by the tub. So it's getting positive thickness axis all around. When they move it outwards, it's not getting that anymore. So it's not touching the sides, it's just sat in the middle. So the, the only opportunity it has to, to get that positive thickness axis is from itself. Or if it wants to do the walls, what's it going to do? It's going to have to press itself against the corner. But to press itself against the back corner and the left side, it's going to have to open itself up and not have that positive thickness axis from hugging itself. So you've changed the entire scenario of that, that snake could have tight hugged and then hugged by the walls in a tight space. It's no longer a tight space because it's not touching, being touched all around it. Do you know how we'll fix that? Hide. Hide. Uh, I commented and said, maybe try hide and explain all of this. And she was like, do you want to know what our response was? The rack is the hide. So I gave, I gave her the solution. I gave her what, well, what possibly could be the solution. Yeah. Possibly what could be the solution. And because of, so, like I said about this, so much indoctrination, this dogmatic information that forces you down to this narrow lane thinking, she couldn't even perceive that she needed to hide. How have we got to the point where you've been, people have been force fed so much indoctrination and dogmatic information that, that we can't even common sense think about it. And that's the problem. We've got so much indoctrination and dogmatic information that people are now in these narrow, narrow lanes of thought that they can't even think outside the box. And even thinking outside the box to give it a hide is not really that far-fetched, is it? But that's the stage we've got to. So my, my question would be, so if I keep all my snakes in racks, and I listened to your talk, I was like, that's great. What would you say would be a tangible set of steps to sort of start moving things out of racks? Because I'm not going to go and buy mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah. Lock up my whole house. Yeah. So if you know in yourself that you're <coughs> basically breeder one, just put in steps to become breeder two, first of all. That way of working, and you're allowing them to think and have experiences, that's free. That's just in your routine. So first of all, you can adapt your routine, and then you can think about, you can get like pop-up tent things for like puppy play pens, so like a big hexagonal thing with like its mesh. So you can put that up somewhere, and you can put things inside it and whatnot. If you really wanted to, and you're a rack keeper, you could put UV over this tent, and when you're doing things, you can put things in this tent, so they experience that. Obviously, if you are a breeder one, and you've got these animals that are so far down this end of like, not being able to cope with new experiences, you're going to have to incrementally get them to that stage with like micro transitions before then. But there's no reason why we can't think logically about what our next step can be. So, how many people clean with kitchen paper? And you have the loo roll at the end. Put, put the loo roll in, in the tub. Everyone thinks that that means nothing because it's just something that is unimportant and it's not fancy or it's not cork or something. What it is, it's novel, new, and they've never experienced it before. So there's scents on, there's scents on there, there's tastes on that, they can put their head through it, they can do things. For about five minutes, that's new, novel, and it's getting things firing. And to be honest, to be fair, in some snakes, I'm like Cali King, they do it for about half an hour. I'm quite surprised by how long they spent obsessing over it. So you can do little things to, to get them to engage and build problem solving and understand things, and then you can transition to bigger areas. But I mean, wild well, oyster, really. Transitioning to translucent translucent racks with hides would be a big step because they can look outside and have information coming in. But I mean, yeah, bigger racks, yeah. Where do you start with training a Burmese python to press a button? <laughs> so I haven't done it myself. I've only done like target training and stuff. But basically, with operant conditioning, you will do something and then pair that with a reward or a stimulus to build the association, then you work with their incremental steps to getting that. So whether they were fed, fed right next to the button and then they got them to, it's very easy if something happens by accident, then you can latch onto that and then get it to work. So I don't know exactly what they did, but say something like, um, I would train my bearded dragon to target, train to a target, and I wanted it to tongue flick and lick it. The tongue flicks, not snake. But I did that and it licked it straight away. So I instantly capitalized upon that. And then because I rewarded that, it did it a second time. So they will learn faster than you think, well, depending on what type of snake it is. If it's been through that process, maybe a bit more slow, but but it, it's doable. There's plenty of people that do it on YouTube. So Laurie Torini has an entire YouTube channel dedicated to training snakes. So, well, your oyster when you're, yeah, just watch that.
She's got 115 snakes, so it's not like it's well tested. Not well tested, should I say? 